This is our last MP Cafe for the year, and furthermore, for many of us today, it will be our last MP Cafe ever. So I really hope you sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. Up first, Nicholas Fairhurst will tell us a little about the little known art and possibly artistic discipline of procrastination. Let's give him a hand. So, you're in a bit of a pickle. You have a deadline for your essay at 11.59 p.m. It is currently 11.50 p.m. and you're still working, just starting on the conclusion. Everything is fine, you say. This is gonna be all right. The conclusion, it doesn't matter all that much. Nobody's gonna pay attention to it. This is fine. You check again. It's 11.54 now. This is fine. It's, it's gonna be all right. You're just finishing up the conclusion. It's just a couple paragraphs. That's more than could be expected usually, you know? That's gonna be all right. You check once more. It is 11.57 p.m. You're starting up on getting the, um, the references done, the bibliography. You need to rush, rush, rush. Get it done. If it's not done, you're gonna need to turn it in as is. You look at the watch once more. 11.58 p.m. There is no more time. Panic. It's 11.59 p.m. And you just managed to turn in the essay. You managed to turn it in in the nick of time. You breathe in. You breathe out. That was a close one. Good morning. My name is Nicholas Fairhurst, and I'm going to be talking a little bit about the art of procrastination. So, you have really nothing to do right now. The essay has been turned in just at the very end. So you start to let your mind wander. You think about some famous artists, for example, and you start to think, could my procrastination make me an artist? Any other day, you would just let this thought go. That's ridiculous. But today you decide to go for it. Firstly, you're going to need to define what is art. So you start thinking a little bit about it, and you come to the conclusion that art is the expression of one's emotions through the means of beauty. So, does procrastination possibly meet these requirements? Firstly, we're going to be looking at the term emotions. So, procrastination makes you feel. It definitely doesn't make you feel great about it. You feel awful for most of the time, but it definitely makes you feel nonetheless. There is feelings of arrogance, regret, uncertainty, fear, and at the very end, relief. So, yeah, there are definitely emotions in procrastination. So that is one item checked off. Next, we're going to be looking at beauty. So, out of all the emotions that we looked at before, relief is a very important one. Relief is a positive feeling. According to Burke, Positive feelings, specifically the ones related to love, are the ones that create beauty. And the sense of relief that you get when you finally turn in an essay right before it's due, it gives you a release from the negative feelings that are fear and dread. So we could possibly say that relief is beautiful. So that is yet another item checked off. And lastly, we're going to look at expression. And this is where the problems start. You see, procrastination is fundamentally bad at expressing stuff. It is bad at communicating the feelings that you have while you're doing it. You might feel dread. You might feel anguish while you're writing an essay at the very end of the time when you're allotted to. But these feelings, and, specific, and especially sorry, the feeling of relief, will never be passed on to your audience, the people that you have to turn stuff in for. So. Uh, sorry, specifically relief, right? So expression is entirely out the window. And it is at this moment, once one of our criteria has not been met, that we start to notice a couple of mistakes that we have made throughout the way. So, firstly, relief is actually not beautiful. It is sublime. The sublime is what is related to negative emotions, fear. And like we mentioned, there is a lot of fear going on and even the relief that you feel, it is just the absence of stress. So, procrastination is not beautiful. Secondly, procrastination causes, it specifically causes these negative feelings. It is not really an expression of these feelings. 
but just the catalyst for them being created. They are not just present in the vacuum. So procrastination not only doesn't express anything, it is not good for you. So that is also out the window. Now that we've put these things in doubt, again, procrastination just makes you feel bad. Procrastination is bad at communicating. So procrastination, in the end, is not art, and one should avoid it at all costs. Thank you. So hello, everyone. Today, we're going to tell you about what makes an artist. And this is made by me, Nina and me, Maria Pinzon. Welcome all. We're going to talk to you about our process when looking at what is art. We wanted to cons take into consideration who makes art and what are the qualities that person has. So the first thing we thought about, art requires passion. In the modern day, so much of art is the monetary value that it is given. And many people create paintings and create art for the monetary value. For that reason, we included this Van Gogh painting, which he created for his little nephew Vincent, not for the monetary value. So first up, we have this quote of C.S. Lewis. Um, this quote is originally from C.S. Lewis's The Four Loves. The original quote is, friendship is unnecessary. Like philosophy, like art, it has no survival value. Rather, it is one of those things which give value to survival. We changed it a bit to include a concept seen in Robert Henry that we read this year. And that's the brotherhood. The brotherhood is in a way similar to friendship because it's, it's, it's a community of people who appreciate art. Friendship is a community of people who appreciate each other, but the brotherhood is a community of artists and people who have love for art. Next up, we have this painting from Van Gogh. It's called Peach Blossoms. I wanted to give you guys the definition of a peach blossom, which is the bare branches of the peach trees coming to life with flowers after a long, cold winter, symbolize rebirth and renewal. Something beautiful always comes after something rough and dull. But the feeling that evokes when making art doesn't necessarily have to be good. Which leads us to our next point. We read Foucault's Analyses of Las Meninas, in which he describes the discomfort that people feel upon looking at this painting, because we are used to seeing art, but not art seeing us. In his, in the reading we did by Burke, he describes passions, including pain and pleasure, which he describes pain as being stronger because it can be inflicted upon us. But pleasure is also what we derive from seeing art. A quote from uh, Burke from the reading is, Pain and discomfort as a strong passion because it's sometimes because it's something that may be imposed on us, whereas pleasure is something we ourselves derive. So we can see that art is not only what the intention was, but it is also what we perceive of it, which leads us on to the next topic, which is comfort. Here we have a painting of Van Gogh. It's called The Bedroom. But if in case some of you guys didn't know, this is Van Gogh's bedroom. We can derive comfort not only because of the tones and the intention that went into the color, but the background story and the intentions it went when painting this, this piece of art. The bedroom is a really, really personal painting because when we, uh, when we present someone our bedroom, we can see this is a place where imagination comes to life, where personal feelings evoke. And um, here in this painting, first we have sympathy for Van Gogh. We have sympathy for Van Gogh because we know his general story, not just as an artist, but as a human. But in Bayas class, we got lucky and got to know Van Gogh into a more personal human level. We got to read his letters and this caused empathy in us. We were able to put ourselves in Van Gogh's shoes. A little background about this painting. These were the colors Van Gogh originally chose for his painting and described it as such in a letter to his brother Theo. You can also see other paintings of his in the background. 
as well as the use of the color purple that he described as something that brought comfort to him. But as Maria mentioned, um, this painting got discolored and thus the version that you see here is the version that we see now. And knowing Van Gogh's story only deepens that comfort within us because we know what intention he had to bring comfort to the viewer. Next up, we have interpretation. Interpretation is not necessarily how the intent, but how it feels, the feelings it evokes. Sometimes we may think of, the, of art and beauty as something subjective, as well as interpretation. Here we have uh, two great sculptures named David, one by Bernini and another one by Michelangelo. Uh, we see in Susan Sontag's essay Against Interpretation, we should not look at merely how things are done, but how they, are, they intend to make us feel. You can see in Michelangelo's David, this is a hero. This is a man triumphant. Whereas Bernini's is still in movement. He's still in, the, in, the, in anticipation of his triumph. We can also see how this one is portrayed more as a hero and something, someone superior because of the level it's, it's put on. The other one is on the viewer's level, making us humane. We're both human. We're both on the same level. Regardless of that, they are both still the same man. It's up to the viewer to determine which story they accept. Trigger warning. Trigger warning. <laughs> this is, next up, we're going to show a very deep and sad picture. Uh, we wanted to talk about horror. Uh, this is a photograph taken by, the, by a photojournalist named Kevin Carter, and it's called The Vulture and the Little Girl. To give you guys a little background about this picture, this vulture is waiting for the little girl to die, for him to eat her. Here, we derive terror from it, because terror is something instant. Terror is something we, is evoked on us just by knowing and seeing the picture. But after hearing at the story and hearing about what could the photographer have done and did it, we have horror. Horror is something buildable. It's especially, um, it's especially true to paintings and art nowadays because they have the capacity to invoke such indignation from the viewers, in which case the artist has to tread carefully, as Maria will tell you about this artist's fate. Sadly, this artist committed suicide a few months after. Um, some even say, the man adjusting his lens to take just the right frame of her suffering might just as well be a predator, another vulture on the scene. Here we can see that sometimes artists prefer their art and their creations over humanity. Sometimes. <laughs> Which leads us on to an image taken by one of my favorite artists ever, Enamored by a Flower by Maria Pinson. We're going to talk to you guys about beauty. Beauty is something that evokes a good feeling within us, as Burke says. But it is not something we merely seek to keep for ourselves. That is something that we want to put out in the world, not only to perceive, but for it to be perceived by others. And that is why we make art. Um, we wanted to read you guys something Schiller said. He said, what is considered beautiful is what elicits a strong response and offers the potential for individual interpretation and creativity. Beauty is often perceived as something that excites a person, providing spontaneous emotional reactions and potential personal expression. Finally, talking about the artist. Artists don't necessarily have to apply this into art, what we just talked about before, the sublime. They have to recognize that this is what art means and no art. It is, it has become apparent through the paintings we have seen of Van Gogh and Caravaggio throughout this meta question that many artists suffer for their art. However, that is not the rule. You may suffer for your art, that is true, but you don't have to. Art may ease your suffering. We can see this in Van Gogh because we know he had a hard life, we know he had a hard past and journey as a professional artist, but he, instead of suffering because of his profession, he eased his way and he poured his emotions into his artistic life. 
Good artists can contemplate beauty, but also find it in places other people don't care to look. In a way, we're all good artists. We're all artists. We find pretty and beautiful in places others may not. And that brings us back to what we said at the beginning. We're all part of the brotherhood in a way. We're all part of a community. Thank you. My name is Ines and today I will be talking about beauty delights. When we were kids, everything seems wonderful and everything seems so magnificent and big. But there's a moment when we transition and after that moment, I couldn't help but wonder so many times. What can we do when the world turns into the unperceptible displease? Nothing is exciting, nothing captures us. How can we love the world then, when we have become disenchanted? I propose beauty, delighting in beauty. And what is beauty? Beauty is glee. Beauty is glee in the small. I see myself in all the things that are outside of me, little treasures of the world, where small beauty lives, in the whimsical and the unassuming. This is the realm of play and ornament that we've discussed with Schiller. And so, with the little treasures of the world, I adorn myself like a Christmas tree. I pick up trinkets from the ground. I like calendars with pictures, spacing posters on the wall. Ugly shoes and freely dresses, stuffed toys and pictured books. I love the morning sunlight and a well-lit room. My Christmas tree is everywhere, lit up and jolly. The world is a Christmas tree and it decorates us wholly. Beauty is tenderness. There is tender beauty in a light that shines the perfect yellow and flickers from time to time. There is evenings when the summer glow reminds me I'll die or when I walk in the park and I hear the trees talk. When I pay attention, I find the lights and I stitch them to my heart. Beauty is tender. And so the tender beauty is so good it hurts a little. It's, it goes beyond me and it crush, in, the, in crushing the light. It moves me to the ground and it overcomes me and I get teary-eyed. But beauty is also brutal, as Burke says. How we love Shakespeare's tragedy, how we adore tragic art. How we love to talk about the war, as long as we keep a tiny distance from horror, it's sublime. In the ruins of what once was, when we see things turn to dust, when we find the light in dust, in loss. But how about if we know what beauty is, where is beauty? Does beauty demand anything from us? Beauty delights and demands to be pondered slowly and gradually. Beauty finds its way in the eye of the beholder. And so beauty is something that needs to be taken care of, it needs to be pondered slowly, like a method. So beauty is in the eye of the beholder. I used to think that meant that beauty was subjective. It has so many dimensions, shapes, everyone has a taste, everything is beautiful according to somebody. But no, it's not beauty in subjectivity or in its many shades. It's beauty in the one that beholds and the one that's capable of seeing. As Schiller says, it's not, we, man not only perceives, man sees. Man takes delight in seeing. It's not about doing it for a purpose. It's not a survival thing only. It's just a matter of beauty. And so beauty delights and I delight in beauty because I want to have a thing of my own and I want to be part of the world. Schiller talks about how this middle grounds and everything, right? He talks about tenderness, but also like this magnificence. He talks about play. He talks about the, the sensuous and the intellect. And so it's the same when he talks about how we want to be in our own selves, how we want to have something of our own and live in individuality. But we also need to connect with the world, with culture, with what's outside of us. That is beauty. And so the world goes round and round, and I run along with it, stopping by to watch the lovely bud of beauty unfold. When we stop, when we pay attention, as we read in Julia Cameron's book, The Artist's Way, that is where we can truly see things that go beyond us in the smallest things. Not only in art we find beauty, but we find beauty in the things that surround us. And those things are what make art be born. But so my conclusion here is that there's not, a, sometimes we live in this world of overwhelming things, right? But beauty is about stopping. Beauty is about patience. It requires us to pick it up from the ground like a gentle flower, but beauty picks us up. Beauty embraces us because man is naturally disconnected, you know, forever in duality. And beauty is the bridging thing between the world and us. Thank you. Before I, I play this, um, what I call magic video for me, I want to give you a little bit more of a background. I don't have any professional equipment to make this other than my camera. Um, but it was really fun to make and I really hope you enjoy. 
For a heads up, I will not be presenting over here so that you can watch the film. And I will be doing a live voiceover. Let's embark on a profound inquiry into the nature of art, transcending the confines of convention and seeking a clarity that goes beyond mere definitions. Can we explore together, not as individuals with preconceived notions, but as participants in a shared journey of understanding? As we contemplate the answers of art, Schiller's words resonant. Man's authentic self emerges into the act of play. Could art be a manifestation of that play, a spontaneous expression that transcends the rigid boundaries of tradition and societal norms? Can we perceive art as a reflection of the freedom that arises when the mind is unbundled and creativity flows without constraint? As we delve into Schiller's thoughts on nature, extending our inquiry beyond the canvas and gallery walls, we encounter the idea that nature in its unfeigned beauty offers us a mirror to our own authenticity. Can art then be a means of bringing unspoiled essence of nature into our consciousness? Is it a reflection of the harmonious dance between the human spirit and the natural world? Turning to Burke's insights, we spoke of beauty of, as congruity, as a harmony that delights our senses. Is beauty confined to the symmetry of form and color, or does it extend into the harmony in our, of our inner being? Can we see beauty not as an external stand-in, but as a reflection of the congruity within ourselves and the world around us? Now, let us inquire into the purposes of art, and it's, it is merely a means of aesthetic enjoyment, a form of entertainment that momentarily distracts us from the complexities of life, or is there a, deep, a deeper purpose, a profound significance that transcends the boundaries of cultural and temporal contexts? Can art, in its truest form, be a mirror reflecting the timeless truths of our existence? Consider the act of creation in art. Is it a deliberate effort to convey a message or does it emerge spontaneously from a state of deep awareness? Can art be a direct expression of our innermost selves, a revelation of the thoughts and emotions that often remain hidden beneath the surface of everyday life? As we delve into these questions, let us not seek for definite, definitive answers, but rather cultivate a state of open inquiry. Can we explore art as a means of self-discovery, a journey into the deeps of our consciousness, or of life and nature's consciousness? In the silence between these words, can we find a space for true understanding? Can we perceive art as an external entity, but as an integral, integral part of our daily lives? A reflection of, co of our collective consciousness? Can we, in this shared in inquiry, uncover the profound truth that art is not separate from the life, but a, an inseparable thread woven into the fabric of our existence? As we conclude the brief explanation of what art is, let us carry these questions with us, allowing then them to linger in our minds and our hearts. Can we continue this inquiry independently, as I invite you to, beyond the confines of this moment, and discover ourselves the boundaries, the boundless depth and significance of art? Thank you.
Hello, welcome to my last MP Cafe of the year. This MP Cafe, I wanted to do something different, not only for the actual MP Cafe, but also change something in my life and do something important. But you'll see what I'm getting at near the end of the presentation. This MP Cafe is called My Art or My Art. Now the question mark originally arose from Bass class yesterday, where we were supposed to bring a piece of art we made and give a statement on how we felt about it. Me, being the useless idiot I usually am, did not bring anything for the class, and I felt kind of bad. But as everyone else pretended, I mean, I, <laughs> I haven't slept. But as everyone else presented, all I could think to myself was, why can everyone else do it? Why is everyone else's art so good? Why didn't I bring anything? Then I thought to myself about all the fancy words that kept popping up this meta question. Beauty, nobility, sublime, nature, pleasure, pain, freedom, morality, etc. Ultimately, I just got more confused. Then I thought about the things I've drawn this past year in my free time and thought about all the things other people here at NPC have drawn and painted. And this is pretty much it. These two things are about the only things I've drawn this past year. It made me even more self-conscious about not being artsy when I'm surrounded by artsy people. So I turned to my notes of this meta question readings to see if anything could help me create some art. But as I scrolled through my notes, I found a quote that made me realize that I already did make some art, although maybe not a masterpiece, I still consider it art. The quote was this one. The spring is the pleasantest of the seasons and the young of most animals. The far from being completely fashioned afford a more agreeable sensation than the full grown because the imagination is entertained with the promise of something more and does not acqu acquiesce in the present object of the sense. In unfinished sketches of drawing, I have often seen something which pleased me beyond the, fin beyond the best finishing. And this reminded me of a little poem I wrote on the last meta question, what is history? Who am I if not my past hopes and dreams? Or am I just what I strive to achieve? Not near, not far, but just in between. Not was, nor will, but just to be. But between the ceiling and the floor, there is just air. And it's hard to picture myself there. I just see a silhouette with hair. Uh, I feel like both of these dealt with the beauty of being in between and not fully formed yet as all humans presently are. Even though the poem isn't all that great, this gave me enough confidence to really try to make something greater than just a little character on MS Paint. And I ended up spending like eight hours drawing two things on my computer, so you better like them. The first drawing is of a guy talking to this gal through a video call. The day outside is bright and the two figures seem to have each other's undivided attention. Before I drew this, before I drew this first one, I came up with a poem that I refined through the creation of the two drawings. And of course, I couldn't resist the urge to make it sad. So here's a poem. An RC car, a blazing star, a failing class. I'm failing math and everything is moving fast. I glanced away and every weekend passed. A creaking voice who spoke in codes and talked in taps, who couldn't go a minute more without a laugh. A tonal shift from sleepless dreams to dreamless sleep. A blood red nose that paints your lips when red blood seeps. When days are measured by how much we speak, I make the couch the next best place to rest my head. You're not allowed to sleep in beds when your girlfriend's dead. Here's the little man from before, but now days have passed and the girl on the screen isn't there anymore. He rests, his head, he rests on his desk with his hands over his head. These drawings represent a lot, but most importantly, they represent a new step in my life. I don't know, I know these don't belong in a museum, but I've never, but I've never put as much effort into art before and it feels good. And hopefully I can become an artsy fartsy person like everyone else here. <laughs> the end. My name is Thomas Fairhurst. I'm nearing the end of my MPC career. And as many of you know, what I will be studying is fashion design. Fashion is something I'm extremely passionate about and I feel it's one of the art forms that lets you express the most and is most connected to you personally. However, like every mass art form, fashion design is not practiced by most people as an art. Many fashion design companies sell them as something as they are not. They sell the label, the designer, the status as a piece of clothing. And everything is sold before the actual art of the clothes and people buy these ideas for a lot of money. A lot of money. <laughs> this is a story of a brand that tried uh, to call all the other companies out and the consumer out as well by playing the game perfectly, dooming them to repeat what they swore to the story in the first place. Perversion is the alteration or corruption of the use of something, changing the course of its original use, 
This is something that happens often when people find benefits in the alter alternative use of an object or concept. When people find convenience in perverting something, it is very hard for it to go back. The most apparent and saddest form of perver perversion we find nowadays is the perversion of art and beauty. Schiller proposed the idea that there is a creator, nature, grants us rationality, sensuality, in order to perceive the world. But it is only through a combination of the both that we can find our humanness, something he describes as beauty and aesthetics. However, we, we tend to pervert these abilities and move away from this. This is Off-White, and this is Virgil Abloh. He founded the brand of Off-White, and he explained the name by saying, it is the gray area between black and white as the color Off-White. There is a chance, a very improbable chance, but a chance nonetheless, that when he said this, he was quoting Schiller. <laughs> this is Schiller, by the way. <laughs> I believe Off-White was not created to be a fashion brand. It was not created to be a house of art where pieces of clothing would help us with our self-expression to become ennobled. It was not created as a business, simply to make money and nothing else. It was created as a criticism, a joke, where the butt of which was all the other fashion companies and the consumer who bought them. One of Virgil Abloh's most recognizable design elements is the quotation marks, as you can see. Uh, he quite literally puts on the product you're buying what it is you're buying. Shoes for walking, rain boots for rainy days, wallet for money. He is putting in your face exactly what you are paying for. Something you use for walking, something you use for rainy days, something you put your money in. As simple as that. And you're paying hundreds, if not thousands of dollars for these items. Off-White is also famous for it, uh, its collaborations with other fashion brands, further drilling in the point that other companies are just that, companies. Companies that are there for no other use other to make money and it may not have started this way for these companies, but it sure is the truth now. Schiller described how even if you want it so badly, humans will inevitably fall into the side of rationality or the side of sensuality. It is inevitable, inevitable that the original vision is going to be perverted. This, sadly, was the truth for Off-White as well. They played the game so well that they lost it. In the wise words of Mr. Gucci Mane himself, please play the video. <laughs> As Gucci Mane says, you can get lost in the sauce. They became what they hated so much, hype beast material. The original vision uh, of criticizing high fashion and the perversion of their art was lost to the same market. After the death of Virgil Abloh in 2021, it just got worse. They became yet another company that charges what they can because they do and they do because they can. Personally, to all of you, don't let your art be perverted. Be a good artist. Search for beauty and the aesthetic. Go to the Megapaka. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. All right. We are almost done with our final Olympic of it for the year, everyone. We have just one presentation left. And this is my presentation. Um, I won't be using any slides or any materials for the day. I will try to just use my words and I will see if it works. So I'm going to be discussing art to be expected and I will be specifically discussing um, a critique of pure art is what I've decided to call my presentation. So without further ado, hello everyone. My name is Nicolas Bonilla. I'm here to discuss a critique of pure art. For a show of hands, just for reference, who here has read Julia Cameron's or even heard of Julia Cameron's The Artist's Way? Most of you here, that is good to know. Um, I have heard of Julia Cameron's The Artist's Way long before I started reading it. It's one of the few art books I was familiar with just because I've heard it discussed here at NPC so very much. And when we finally got to read it, I was so excited to see what she had to say. And I agreed with most of it. I love the way she viewed spirituality in art. I love the way she discussed art as a whole. However, she made one argument that I couldn't help but disagree with. Julia Cameron, in her artist's way, discusses the notion of a censor. A person who, or a person, or like a little voice in the back of your head that stops you from achieving your art's potential. And she ascribes this censor to the logical brain. And the issue that I saw with this is that it reminded me a lot of an old, old principle that I was taught when I was a kid that always struck me a little bit wrong. And this is the idea of the left brain and the right brain. The left, this theory argues that people are either left-brained or right-brained, and that people that are left-brained are automatically more logical and more analytical, and the people that are right-brained are more creative and free-form. 
And this, in, when I was younger, actually sort of encouraged me to stick to one side and prevented me from looking at the other. And Julia Cameron's text, I felt, did the same. And the author that helped me sort of like break through this confusion, as with many of the other people here, was Friedrich Schiller, one of Kant's students. Kant, the author of A Critique of Pure Reason, which is the reason why I have called my presentation this. Um, Schiller argues that creativity and aesthetic comes from a combination of both sense and reason. And throughout his text, Schiller always argues for a balance between the two in everything he tries to do. And this encouraged me to try to look for a balance in my argument and in my belief of the left brain and right brain too. And that's what I'm here to discuss today. Essentially, I want to argue that we should not divide ourselves in this way, that the left brain and the right brain are, even though they are true to some capacity, they should not be taken as a hard law. Creativity and logic act together in many aspects of day-to-day -day life, even in aspects where we consider one field to be predominant. I've mentioned this before, I believe, but in mathematics, we require logic naturally to build through a conclusion to ensure that what we are saying is correct. But the questions we ask and the answers we start trying to solve to words are a purely creative question. It begins from a spontaneous vision. On the contrary, art begins with a, spo with a spontaneous vision as well. And we require logic in some capacity for most forms of art to understand how to put that vision down on paper or on canvas. And as usual, I am here on stage today to send a brief message. And it's not a message for everybody here, it is a message for you. For you, dear NPCer, who do not know how to answer the question of what do you study, not because you don't want to share, but because what you study is so many different things. It is a message for you who cannot even answer who are you or what are you, not because you don't know, but because you feel it would take you an eternity to put it down into words, because because you study and you are so many separate things. And all I really want to ask of you is that you not let yourself fall into this final division, this division between the artist and the logician, that you see yourself a bit as both and you try to exercise a bit that other half of yourself. Thank you so much.